so in today's lecture we will be continuing in the topic of uh, induction motors uh, today we will see uh, how to start the induction motor uh, we will first spend a few more minutes on the single phase induction motor and then uh, we'll see how to start a three phase induction motor and uh, we'll investigate the properties of it in more detail uh, so last week we have discussed uh, the construction of a single phase induction motor uh, I told you that uh, the single phase induction motor cannot start by itself uh, because uh, it creates a pulsating magnetic flux so uh, we need some way how uh, we can actually start it <clears throat> and uh, the way how to start it automatically is uh, to have uh, two perpendicular coils in the motor uh, that uh, are mechanically arranged by the ninth angle of 90 degrees and uh, we will also produce uh, the different currents in the in the winding so uh, we'll create uh, one current that has some phase shift and in the ideal case uh, the second current in the second winding should have a 90 degrees phase shift and in this way we will be able to start the motor because when the two magnetic fields interact together they will create a rotating magnetic field which can start the motor and at the end uh, we can disconnect one of those two windings the start to winding and uh, only the one <coughs> winding will be in operation <coughs> so uh, construction wise the uh, induction motor for a single phase is built with two perpendicular windings although we will power it just with a single phase current so now let's take a look on how we can actually achieve this phase shift uh, we can use three approaches uh, one approach is that we use a resistance that's uh, less common because uh, we uh, will need to have uh, quite a big heat sink for this resistance uh, or we could use an inductance or we could use a capacitance uh, so the resistance is not used typically due to the power losses that you have on the resistor during startup we have seen that uh, the motor takes a quite large current and uh, this would mean a high power loss on the resistor we know that uh, P equals to R times I squared so the higher the current the higher the loss on the resistor <clears throat> on the other hand if we use an inductor or a capacitor uh, there will not be any jaw losses on it uh, well at least in the case we consider this to be an ideal component uh, and uh, we will use uh, the energy in a more efficient way so the most common way how to start an induction motor is with using a capacitance. In all three cases uh, this element is connected in series with the starting winding. So uh, the connection looks as follows. Here is the induction motor itself. Here we have the main winding. So this main winding is turned on at all times whatever we have the voltage here from the power supply and here we have the starting winding so this starting winding this current flows only when uh, you start are starting the motor here it's uh, shown in the case of uh, an inductor resistor and capacitor in fact this is an equivalent circuit diagram so the main winding ideally should have only inductance and not this resistance and here uh, we uh, ideally uh, use the capacitor but it has some inductance and it has some resistance as well uh, the function of this centrifugal switch is uh, to disconnect the motor uh, when uh, you are above some rpm so this centrifugal switch is uh, normally closed so when you start the motor the current flows in the starting winding and when you are above some given RPM then this centrifugal switch will disconnect 
and uh, the current here will be interrupted. The starting winding here is uh, typically not designed to operate at all times. So we need to disconnect the starter winding. If we would not disconnect the starter winding, it would overheat and uh, the motor would be destroyed. So it's quite important to have uh, this centrifugal switch in this connection. Uh, you could do it manually, for example, this could be a button and uh, you start the motor by pressing the button, it uh, starts rotating and then you just disconnect the switch <coughs> and uh, you interrupt the current in the starter winding. So the centrifugal switch is a very important component, it uh, typically disconnects uh, when the operating speed is uh, when the motor reaches uh, the near operating speed. Uh, in order to start the motor, uh, you need to select the proper value of this starting capacitor. <coughs> so there are formulas uh, how to calculate this. Uh, we will not see the formulas, but this is typically some uh, value of, let's say, few microfarads, uh, approximately. And the reason why we need to select the capacity correctly here is that uh, we want to produce an accurate phase shift. So what we would ideally want is that the phase shift of current between the starter winding and between the main winding would be 90 degrees. And uh, when we have discussed the analysis of AC circuits, uh, we have seen how actually to calculate this. Uh, it is, this is a circuit where we have an inductor, where we have uh, a capacitor, and uh, it's possible to calculate uh, the capacity in such a way that uh, we are approaching this uh, 90 degrees. So this is the analysis of the uh, AC circuit. Uh, usually uh, we are using cheap electrolytic capacitors that are uh, not polarized in this case because we uh, want to work with AC currents. So those are special capacitors. And uh, those capacitors are not designed to work at all times with this high voltage. Here we have uh, relatively high voltage. Uh, by high voltage I mean uh, it's, a, it's in a single phase motor this is neutral and this is line so we have 230 volts RMS voltage so the maximum voltage uh, will be something like 325 volts and uh, the, mo the capacitors here is usually rated at something like 400 or 600 volts. So it's also a mechanically large capacitor uh, and uh, it is not rated to work with this AC voltage for forever. So uh, it's only for a short period and again this is the goal of this centrifugal switch to make it start. Uh, here is what will happen in a sense of uh, the torque speed characteristic. So this is how the torque speed characteristic would look like if uh, you operate it in single phase mode. So in single phase mode we have seen that here the starting torque is zero and the motor will not start itself. So during startup we need to create a large starting torque and this is uh, created by the combined main and starting winding and by the phase shift that we actually uh, have uh, created by the capacitor. So here we create quite large starting torque. The motor will start rotating. It is following this curve in the torque speed characteristic. So now it's acting like we could call it two-phase motor. And uh, here is the action where the centrifugal switch will disconnect the starting winding. So uh, it is set to disconnect when we are above some given speed, uh, we need to be above this speed at the maximum at the maximum torque. Because I told you that here at this region, uh, the tor the motor does not operate in a stable mode, and uh, we need to be in this part of the curve. So somewhere here is where the centrifugal switch will disconnect, and then with the torque speed characteristic will jump to the single phase mode, which is here. And the motor operating point is somewhere in this region, in the linear region 
of the top speed characteristic and you can see that uh, when we switch to the single phase mode uh, we have a smaller torque available because we have just uh, the magnetic field from a single phase <clears throat> so single phase induction motors are typically used uh, for smaller appliances few hundred watts for example maybe up to one kilowatt uh, not that not more uh, because then the current that uh, you take from the power network from single phase uh, would be too high uh, it's not saying that they are it's not possible to have a larger single phase motor but it's not very common uh, let's compare um, the construction of this single phase motor with uh, something else that will be called uh, a shaded pole motor uh, i will show you briefly the construction it is also a single phase motor but uh, it, is, it is more economical it means that uh, you have a cheaper motor because uh, you don't need to have two windings in the motor and you don't need to have um, a starting capacitor um, maybe I will explain it uh, first uh, with this uh, with this picture how this works and then we'll come back to the properties uh, so this is a single phase motor so we're still powering the main winding but we have seen that uh, by using just one winding we're not able to start the motor because we don't have the rotating magnetic field so in this case in this shaded pole motor the starting winding is replaced by something that we call shaded pole here and here and the goal of the shaded pole is uh, to create a magnetic flux uh, that will help the main magnetic flux to start the motor so the way it works is that here the main winding will create a magnetic flux the magnetic flux is flowing in the iron like this and through the rotor of course and uh, it is also inducing some current in this winding and in this winding in the shaded in the shaded pole winding uh, this winding is uh, short circuited so there will be some current flowing here in this winding and in this winding as well since this current was created by induced voltage there will be a phase shift and uh, in the ideal circuit the phase shift between voltage and current if it's an inductive load that will be 90 degrees so we will have 90 degrees phase shift between the main current here and between the current that is actually flowing in this shaded pole winding and this current this winding will create its own magnetic field as well so this will interact with the main magnetic field and uh, it will help the motor to start now this kind of motor is uh, less expensive than uh, the normal single phase induction motor because you just don't need the second starting winding but on the other hand it is also less efficient so we are of creating a pulsating magnetic flux and uh, the typical use of those shaded pole induction motors is in appliances where you require very low power because this this is a very this is a very small efficiency uh, I will tell you the numbers a little bit later but it's few percent only uh, this is how it actually works so uh, we generate the main magnetic flux from the main winding and this will induce the current and hence another magnetic flux that we have in the shaded pole uh, we will have a different amplitude of the magnetic flux obviously the magnetic flux in the main winding will be larger and uh, in the shaded pole winding it will be smaller but it does not really matter uh, what is important is that we will have a different phase angle and hence the two magnetic fields will have a different phase shift and they will interact together and they will create uh, the uh, rotating magnetic field uh, the motor efficiency is very small 
uh, it is usually uh, in a the order of a few percent only so it is used for applications where you really don't care that much about uh, the efficiency but you want to have a, a very low cost appliance uh, without any additional components and also uh, a very reliable application so it's typically used for small fans uh, it is used for other household equipment with small torque such as you could you could find it in in uh, in clocks for example uh, you could find it in old um, audio appliances where you are playing some some vinyl disc for example so all this all this uh, was uh, using this kind of um, single face shaded pole mode uh, let's take a look on how the motor is looking like so we can typically uh, find uh, that it's looking like this uh, here is the main winding so this is uh, powered by single phase current uh, here we have a squirrel cage rotor so again no winding it's just uh, a piece of aluminium and uh, it's forming the squirrel cage it is similar to the one as we have seen in uh, the three phase induction motor now this core is the magnetic circuit it needs to be made from iron uh, it can be laminated in order to decrease the losses uh, it uh, can be also a solid piece of iron because here really we don't care that much about the efficiency uh, the typical power where you may expect this kind of motor is few watts so you're looking for a motor that has 5 watts 10 watts 20 watts at maximum something like in this order of magnitude so it's not like a kilowatt motor definitely not uh, and here you can see the shaded pole so this is a pole in the iron circuit and this is the copper wire this is the shorted coil it's usually like uh, two three turns of a very thick wire you can see here the shaded pole and here the shaded pole as well so as the magnetic flux is flowing like that it will induce voltage here in this winding and in this winding and it will help the motor start now now this is a motor uh, from a household fan so it's a very reliable stuff you don't require any capacitor that will dry in time uh, and uh, the only only thing that uh, basically can be destroyed is the bearing here or you could destroy the, the main winding due to some overcurrent overheating for example okay uh, some more pictures of the motor here you can see that this is a laminated iron so again this is the main winding energized at all times this is the shaft here with the bearing here is the squirrel cage rotor we can see a little bit here of the rotor material so here this is the slot and this is the slot where we have actually the bars from aluminium and uh, here we can see two turns of uh, copper wire that's the shaded pole winding here in detail how this looks like when you remove the motor so we can see nicely the lamination we can see here the, this uh, this turn goes like this and then it's going in the other one and like this and then they connect together so this is really a very simple stuff mechanically uh, we can see that this point this uh, this uh, piece uh, was used to just uh, fix the uh, core together so it after this is aligned uh, they press it in the press and this this and this will fix uh, the material together so it's a really easy construction uh, very reliable but low efficiency low cost okay um, so that's all for single phase induction motor and uh, now uh, we'll be talking about uh, the properties of uh, induction motors in general and uh, we will focus on different groups that you can find on the market on the properties and uh, also uh, on uh, the ways how you can actually start the induction motor uh, let's repeat this chart we have seen this chart now many times now so this is the torque speed characteristic now this is a three-phase induction motor uh, here we can see the dependence of torque on speed again the nominal operating point is here so somewhere here we will have the nominal uh, torque that uh, we have available uh, during operation 
uh, the speed difference between the synchronous speed and this speed is the slip. Uh, we can see the power factor, how is it evolving. So initially uh, we have a quite small power factor and uh, then it is increasing and then we are somewhere around here with the power factor. So typically the power factor of a induction motor operated at nominal point is about 0 0.8. Uh, so here it acts like a really inductive load, here it's a uh, less inductive it's more resistive float in this case and we can see also the current how is it evolving so typically the full motor current is somewhere around here and uh, during startup here we have quite a high current so this is quite typical between three to seven times uh, the starting current uh, compared to the full current load so for this reason you also need a different circuit breaker if you are using motors because motors during startup will take quite a high inrush current uh, and we'll see later how we can actually uh, limit this startup current we'll see several ways how this can be done uh, this is an example of uh, the efficiency of uh, an induction motor this is an example an efficiency map from a 2007 Toyota Camry hybrid motor which uses uh, an induction motor uh, we can see uh, the typical regions now uh, typically the motors are arranged in such a way that uh, at some region that we will see here in this region they are operating in um, maximum torque mode so constant torque is available here in this region and uh, at this region uh, we are operating it at constant uh, power mode so if you plot the chart where uh, you will have uh, the uh, speed here and here we will have power torque and power then uh, typically it looks like this initially you have a constant torque that is available and then you have uh, decreasing torque but uh, you have constant power so if you plot this uh, if I will now add uh, the power in the chart uh, then it looks like this here I have increasing or this should be linear sorry for that and uh, here I have constant power available it should be again flat line constant power available and this is visible here here in this region uh, we have constant torque and in this region uh, we have constant power and the reason is that we want to save weight you can surely design a motor that will operate in this whole region with a full torque but uh, typically for traction applications this is not required at all above some given speed uh, you just want to have constant power available so you can go with drop of torque that actually you don't need anymore and here we can see that the efficiency of the electric motor is changing it is a function of uh, current it is a function of uh, speed so uh, if this would be a fixed speed application for example let's say a conveyor belt uh, you ideally would position the motor operating region somewhere around here because here we have the maximum efficiency you can see here approximately the, the numbers so in this case it's 92 percent it's quite typical 92 93 something in this range uh, and uh, when you are increasing the torque then the efficiency is dropping and the same also when you're increasing the speed so here you can see that the speed the speed is increasing efficiency is dropping uh, because here uh, we are increasing mechanical losses and uh, when I'm increasing the torque uh, then I'm increasing uh, especially jowl losses uh, in the winding and also of course iron losses so that's the reason why here this uh, efficiency is dropping as well uh, however if this is a variable speed application such as uh, an electric car or some electric motorbike then uh, typically it's operating in this whole efficiency map so it depends on the driving cycle and actually if you are dr driving with low speed but high torque for example uphill you have a quite 
low efficiency. Now this does not start uh, th in this chart we don't see the values at the very beginning but obviously the efficiency here is zero when you have uh, zero speed but you're applying some torque you don't have any output power so this chart goes all the way to zero at this axis and it goes also all the way to zero here because uh, you ha don't apply any torque so we can see how this is dropping here we have something like 80% uh, it may be 60, it actually depends on the motor construction. So when you have an application you need to think in advance at what speed range it will be working and then select a suitable motor. Uh, now let's take a look on why uh, we actually uh, need to have some info about efficiency of uh, motors. So this is a chart from uh, 2011 and uh, here we see what is the global electricity demand around the world and uh, what applications are actually using this energy. And we can see that about 46% of, the, of electrical energy that we produce is, is uh, consumed by electric motors. Uh, about 20% for light, about 20% for, uh, for heat and the, the, the rest electronics and eventual electrolysis for for chemical production of many materials. Uh, so th this means that almost about one half of all energy that we produce is consumed by electric okay. motors. So, Hello. Uh, uh, yes. I want to ask, you're talking about the motors 46%. Uh, is it industrial? Like, yes. is it mostly industrial? Yes, industrial, yes. It's this is not hard uh, load, obviously. Okay. So in, in industrial systems, uh, households are quite different. In households, uh, it would be uh, heat, light, and other stuff. Motors, probably not that much. So we need to have some standards that uh, now define what is the efficiency of the motor. Uh, so uh, globally, uh, about a few years ago, like maybe 10 years ago, uh, many countries have adopted different standards uh, that define the efficiency of uh, different motors and uh, only some efficiencies with efficiency above something are actually allowed by law so it's not a, like, a, like a technical limit but uh, it's a limit implied by regulations uh, so here we have four groups it's called IE1 through 4 uh, here is the name standard efficiency and so on and uh, here we can see what countries have adopted that at what time and at what power approximately I will later show you uh, the, the curve uh, for the uh, efficiency of the motor now what typically happens in uh, the induction motors is that there is a quite strong dependence between the power of the motor and between the efficiency if you have an induction motor with 100 kilowatts, it will be more efficient than an induction motor for 1 kilowatt, for, for sure. So, for this reason, the regulations, as we have seen here, are typically defined for some power and above. So, for example, for EU, now uh, this premium efficiency class motor was adopted in 2015. And at that time, it was applied for motors with more than 7.5 kilowatt of power. And starting from 2017, it is even valid for smaller motors. And other motors that are not fulfilling those efficiencies are not allowed to be sold on the market. They can be still used if you use them in some production in the factory. But if you want to buy a new motor, uh, you cannot have these motors on the market. Uh, so we can see that this is increasing efficiency more and more. Now the, the goal uh, is uh, to have uh, higher efficiency. And uh, if we want to study what is the most important stuff in uh, the the motor professor sorry yes oh 
uh, last slide, uh, when we say standard efficiency, do you know, or high efficiency, what's the number? What's the number for that? Because it doesn't say exact numbers. Yes, I will. Tell, I, I have a slide. I have a slide uh, a little bit later, I think. Oh, I, will, I, will, I will find it very quickly on the internet. It's uh, something about 92% here, roughly. I will show you the numbers. I will, I will find it on the internet. Uh, so, uh, let's take a look first on how can we achieve a higher efficiency. Uh, so, uh, when you take a look inside of the motor, uh, we basically have uh, more components for the loss. One component is the jaw loss in the stator winding here. Uh, this is already made from copper, so uh, we cannot uh, really decrease the loss that we have here in the winding. Now basically the only way how you can improve the efficiency is uh, to use different materials for the magnetic circuit, so better materials for the magnetic circuit here for the iron. But also you can reduce the rotor losses. So when I showed you the video about the production of induction motors, uh, then uh, we have seen that uh, it used to be aluminium, but today in many cases it is a copper rotor. Uh, this has some effects of course. Uh, first of all the motor is more expensive because here you need to use copper and then it's more difficult to produce so the motor will be even more expensive. Now the increase in price can be between 100 maybe 300 percent. So you have a better efficiency motor but it uh, is a uh, definitely more expensive motor. Uh, I will very quickly now uh, look for the for the numbers uh, for the for the motors I did not uh, put that in the presentation so uh, I will just uh, find uh, find some uh, some picture on the internet. Uh, that uh, will give us some numbers. Uh, now, uh, in this uh, slide, well, I just found very quickly the, uh, the some check check uh, paper from a journal. But uh, here we can see approximately the numbers. So uh, for the first class, for the standard IE1, uh, here it's not a constant number. But it is a curve like this for all of them because uh, it's known that for smaller motors uh, you have smaller efficiencies. So all motors under this uh, blue dashed area are uh, no, no sorry it's a, this is a gray gray curve here so this is the gray curve. So for example if I would be talking about uh, 1.5 kilowatt motors and here we are about 75% smaller motors are not that efficient and as we are increasing the power then we are going to higher and higher efficiencies and IE3 here that's uh, the before last standard uh, here we can see that there is an increase of few percent so it's not a number but it's a, it is a curve like this and I, IE4 the super premium efficiency would be even a little bit higher approximately two three percent a little bit higher so this could be something like 95 96 percent so based on the re regulation standards now you have only those smart motors available on the market so this is a first criteria that you need to consider when you are selecting the motor for your application the efficiency now the second criteria is uh, for what Professor, application sorry. you will actually use. I have a question. Yes. So, for example, one industry in Europe used the old version of motors, and it has, uh, of course, uh, like efficiency less than uh, the standard, like it's the highest standard. Is it okay for that company to still use the old version? Well, they can use uh, it, but the they cannot sell it. So, so if you have a factory, they, sell. Uh, they, they cannot sell. They, they cannot sell sell the motors. 
So they cannot even sell the old motors, right? No. It's illegal. No. They cannot sell it, but you can see here that this was adopted somewhere like, like I don't know, 15 years ago. And there was a quite long time before this actually uh, was applied. So, uh, if this was announced, I don't know, 2010, then they had time until 2017 to sell all the other, all the old models. So the motors can still be used in factories, but they cannot be legally sold on the market. Okay, so uh, let's take a look here. Uh, the induction motor can drive many applications. It uh, can be used for an elevator, it can be used for a drill, for a conveyor belt, uh, for a crusher for rocks and so on and so on. And uh, all those applications will have different requirements in terms of the torque speed characteristic. So when you are designing a machine, you need to have an idea about what torque where you will require. So this is such an example. Here uh, we have uh, the value of the speed basically, but here it's uh, it's shown like a ratio between zero speed and and, and uh, synchronous speed. So this is basically speed, and uh, this is the torque that we have available. Uh, normally the motor is operating in this region, but uh, during startup the motor may require for the application to provide higher torque. So there are four different classes called A, B, C and D of motors. They have a little bit different construction and uh, they, the difference is in the shape of the torque speed characteristic. So for example if you look uh, here on the class B you can see that this is a quite flat response of the torque and here the maximum available torque is uh, not that different from the starting torque. On the other hand, if we look on class D, we have a very large torque here available initially. So this is uh, three times uh, larger than the no nominal point. The nominal point, by the way, would be here. And uh, here we have three times available torque. So this is for a machine that uh, requires a very high starting torque. For example, you have a crusher uh, full of stone and you want to make it run. So here we have a large starting torque. The price we pay for this, if we modify the torque speed characteristic in this way, is that we have a, here uh, a less uh, hard uh, torque speed characteristic. So in this region, you see that the speed is dropping more as you are increasing the torque. On the other hand, for class A, for example, here uh, this is almost no drop at all. Uh, when I showed you my Excel sheet where we've seen this torque speed characteristic uh, in live calculation, uh, we have seen how this is done. It's done by altering the rotor resistance, especially. So here this motor will have a different rotor resistance than this one. Now let's take a look on uh, class C. Here on class C we see that we have uh, about 2.5 uh, starting torque and uh, then the torque is dropping and uh, again the nominal operating point is here. So we have uh, even uh, let's say hard, uh, more hard uh, torque speed characteristic here in this case than for class, uh, for class D. Uh, let's take a look on where this is actually used. So class A is uh, typically used in applications where you require just a normal starting torque. So those are applications uh, that are not that loaded uh, during startup. For example, fans, blowers, centrifugal pumps. For this application, the uh, requirement for the load looks like this. Here we have speed and here we have torque that is actually used by the load and uh, for a fan or for a centrifugal pump it typically looks like this. So initially we have a very small torque that we need and as we are increasing the speed then uh, we need more and more torque. So in this case we have this class A curve, so class A motor. 
Now for some other applications that are similar, uh, we may want to reduce the starting current. Uh, if we would plot a similar chart here, but, but here we would have uh, the uh, current instead of torque, uh, we would see that for class A, uh, the starting current is somewhere between 3 to 7 times the nominal current. So it's a quite large inrush current. And class B motors solve this by uh, changing the resistance of the rotor winding. And uh, here we can see that uh, this will decrease the starting current, but the price for it that we have a somewhat smaller starting torque and also the maximum torque is a little bit smaller. So this is for similar applications, but uh, th they would uh, the torque speed characteristic of the load would look something like this. So here we would require a larger starting torque. Uh, now class C is uh, for applications that require a high starting torque and a low starting current. And typically this is for compressors, conveyors, uh, pumps, crushers and so on. So in this case you already have some load that you need to overcome. You have uh, some crusher with stones that is loaded and uh, you need to have some starting torque here to, to make it the machine run. Uh, and class D is for the highest starting loads. So uh, you have uh, applications such as uh, presses, bulldozers, die stamping machines, anything that uh, really requires some huge starting torque initially. So here we have a very high starting torque and then we normally operate the machine at this region. So those four classes are available and based on your application you have to choose the correct class for the machine. Uh, so now let's take a look on the ways how we can uh, limit actually the startup current. Now when the motor is standing still and uh, when we connect it directly to the power network then it will take a short circuit current and usually it's somewhere in this range from 5 to 10 times the nominal current. So already for small motors with a few kilowatts of power we need some way how we can actually limit the startup current. Uh, we can simply not connect the motor directly to the power network. The direct connection to the power network is uh, it's possible to use it for small motors, few kilowatts but then the inrush current would be very high and uh, you would uh, cause trouble in the power network and you need some way how to limit the startup current. There are many ways how this can be done. So now let's take a look on uh, just some of them. Uh, first of all, the direct connection that we have here in the first uh, row uh, it is used only for small motors, so typically for motors only for a smaller than about 5 kilowatts. You can calculate the current uh, yourself, but this is a, like a usual limit that we can use. It is very simple, we just connect it directly and that's it. You don't require any other device, but uh, the disadvantage is that you have a really high inrush current and this will cause voltage drops uh, in the power network. Uh, what are the other ways? Uh, well, uh, we have seen in the torque speed characteristic that uh, the torque and current of the induction motor is a function of voltage. And we have actually seen that the torque of the motor is actually a function that is proportional to the second power of uh, voltage. So if I decrease the voltage, I will decrease the startup torque, but I will also decrease the startup current. So like this, I can use a transformer. I could use a, a stepwise transformer, so I started with small voltage or I could use an auto transformer where, where I could uh, uh, gradually increase the voltage. So this provides you lower startup current, but on the other hand you decrease 
the torque as the torque is a function of second power of the voltage. So this is not that often that it's used, but it's possible. Um, the third possibility is that uh, we connect some impedance in series with the stator. For example, a resistor. So we will have the induction motor, we will have the resistor connected in series to the stator winding. Uh, during startup, we connect uh, the resistor in series. This will decrease the voltage that we have in the motor. So again, the startup torque will decrease with square of the voltage. Plus, we will have a losses on the resistive part of the impedance. So we will lose some power on those resistors. On the other hand, it's quite simple. Uh, when the motor started, which you can detect, for example, with a centrifugal switch, uh, then you can disconnect those resistors and connect the motor directly. So it's relatively simple to use this approach. But be aware of the losses that you will have on the resistor. So it's not, it's, it used to be uh, used recent, but uh, recently we prefer a more electronic circuit that uh, don't have those disadvantages. Uh, we can use a soft starter. Uh, I will explain you um, either today or next week how this is actually working. Uh, but for now, let's just say that uh, we can control the startup torque. Uh, we may have problems with electromagnetic compatibility, so EMC. This may produce uh, some distortion. But on the other hand, uh, we can decrease the current. And uh, we have a continuous startup, so we can gradually increase the speed. And we can control the startup time. On the soft starter, we can set uh, with, uh, with some knobs uh, how long uh, does it take to, to actually start the motor. So uh, this is today quite common to use uh, as a starter. It's called a soft starter device. Uh, some other ways how uh, we can do this. Uh, this is also very common. Uh, we can use the star to delta connection. Uh, the motor, a three-phase induction motor, can be connected in two configurations. It is a star or a delta connection. Now, a star connection looks like this. We have one winding, third winding, and second winding, like that. So now this is a star connection. And now in the delta connection, it looks like this. It has a form of delta, like that. So those are the three windings. And uh, here uh, you have one phase, second phase, third phase. Uh, if you start it in star connection, now you can decrease the startup current to one third of uh, the current in delta. So larger industrial motors are connected in such a way that they normally operate in delta mode, like that. But they start in star mode, like this. So it, there are special switches that allow you to change the configuration. And the advantage is that you decrease the current to one third, but on the other hand, you decrease uh, the startup torque also to one third. So it will not be useful uh, if you have a high load machine uh, where you need to really start it directly with a high current. Uh, so this typically this is used for motors uh, with uh, powers but lo lower than 100 kilowatts and uh, it can be used only for motors that operate at, at the denom operating point here only in delta mode. Uh, now those other ways, uh, those two uh, resistor and inductor, uh, they are very similar. In both cases we connect a resistor or inductor in series with the startup winding uh, no, no startup with the state of winding. Uh, in both cases, uh, we can achieve lower current. Um, but th here, note that this is in rotor. Here, rotor and rotor. Uh, and uh, it is possible to use this only for uh, motors that have a bound rotor. So we cannot use this uh, for a squirrel cage motor. 
so this is not that common because uh, the the, vi the wound rotors are definitely less common than squirrel cage induction motors and uh, the last possibility shown here in the table that is actually preferred today is uh, to use a frequency inverter and a frequency inverter we'll see how it is working uh, next week uh, it is a device that allows you to produce uh, variable frequency so you can continuously start up the motor you can define the startup time you can lower the currents you can control the torque but on the other hand it is uh, quite expensive compared to all the other previous options and it can cause trouble with EMC it is, this is the preferred way today uh, in uh, applications where you need speed control so for example if uh, this would be something like an electric car then basically you will have a kind of frequency inverter in there because you need to control the speed if this would be a conveyor belt with a constant speed there is no reason to use a frequency inverter because of the expenses now typically the frequency inverter is about the same price like the induction motor itself so if you really don't need speed control then uh, you can use the star delta switch or uh, you can use the soft starter just to go directly to the speed and that's it Professor, what is EMC? Electromagnetic compatibility. So this stands uh, for electromagnetic compatibility. Okay, uh, so now let's take a look on how we can actually control the speed of the induction motor. And this will slowly guide us uh, to the frequency inverter. Now this formula is showing us what is the angular speed as a function of frequency of pole pairs and slip so this is the frequency of the power network this is the number of pole pairs this is given by the construction of the motor and the slip is uh, given by your operating point and those three symbols show how we can actually change the motor so first of all we can change the stator voltage frequency this is what the frequency inverter will do uh, we can change also here the number of pole pairs for example uh, we may build a special motor that will have uh, one pole pair and uh, two pole pairs and by changing the connection we can actually change the speed of the motor now obviously this will be a stepwise change so we can only change between several possibilities the frequency change can be continuous we can continuously change the speed of the induction mode and uh, by using the slip uh, we can actually use the properties of uh, the torque speed characteristic how does it work so if you remember the torque speed characteristic here speed and here torque we have something like this uh, then uh, the way it is working is that uh, we start from some operating point like this and then by changing the properties of the motor we can slightly change the speed like that so it, it works only in a very small uh, region of the speed now the way uh, this is working is that we know that the torque is uh, proportional to the square of voltage so if we slightly change the voltage that we have in the motor we will change torque that the motor is producing and uh, for example if it's a fan that has a torque speed characteristic like this then it will slightly change the speed so this works by changing the voltage there are electronic circuits that allow you to to do this uh, it is suitable for loads with quadratic or cubic torque speed characteristic which is this one so such as fans it's not suitable if you have a conveyor belt or something else like a crusher it works only because this has a this shape of the torque speed characteristic 
So if I decrease the voltage a little bit, I will decrease the produce torque and together with the load it will uh, increase, uh, so decrease uh, the available speed that we actually have. So this works only in a very small range. You can use it for a fan uh, to, to change the, sp the speed by by few percent usually. Uh, this is uh, uh, a more uh, this is like a better uh, chart that I have just showed you. Uh, so this is an example where you have uh, the full voltage, 100% voltage, and here you change it to 50%, and this is the characteristic of the load. Uh, by using uh, this drop we know that the torque will decrease by uh, the, the second power of the voltage so four times so this will jump to this uh, part of the of the torque speed characteristic so here in this region we may slightly uh, change the speed you can see here approximately the region uh, where we may change it so let's say the operating point is somewhere here and we are able to change it here so we can see here this range is few percent, maybe 10 percent, 15 percent of the nominal RPM. We cannot go all the way down here, we cannot start the motor like this, because here the torque is not available. So this is used only for, for very specific applications like fans, for example, in some cases. Uh, if you have a special motor which has a variable number of poles, uh, then you can change the, the speed also stepwise. Uh, such a motor is shown here. So this requires a special construction of the stator of the motor. Uh, here you have an example between four pole and two pole motor. You can see that in the two pole configuration here uh, we have those two windings connected in series and those two connected in series. Now this is obvious. This is uh, shown only for a single phase connection. So uh, the other connections, uh, you would have to have this in series and this in series as well. Uh, now, if you reconnect this, you can create four pole arrangements. So one, two, three, four poles in this case. And if you go back to the equation, uh, you can see how uh, the the speed will change. Uh, basically it's omega times here uh, we have the frequency and uh, here we have the number of uh, pole pairs uh, times some constant I'd say right now uh, so you can see that this is a stepwise control I can switch from two pole configuration into four so uh, on our power network where we have 50 Hertz the two pole configuration the one is here there, there will be 60 times frequency so uh, one pole pair here would give me 3000 rpm and uh, two pole pairs here would give me 1500 rpm this is the synchronous speed so we can see okay I can drop from 3000 to, uh, to 1500 and the next step would be 750 and so on and so on so this requires really a special construction of the motor so it is used, but it's not that very common. Uh, and the last possibility that is actually preferred today is uh, to use a frequency invert. And so now we'll take a look on how this frequency inverter is actually working. It is quite common to use this kind of uh, controller today. So here we have a three-phase induction motor. Uh, here is the power supply network so from the power supply network we have fixed voltage and fixed frequency in our case Czech Republic we have 400 volts this is the line to line voltage and uh, we have 50 Hertz frequency and if I want to control the speed of the motor I need to change the frequency of the current that I'm feeding into this uh, induction motor uh, what you see here is called a voltage source inverter. There are other topologies as well, but this is the most common one. And it's also the topology that is uh, most easier to understand. Now it has three basic components. Here 
we have a diode rectifier. The way this works is that I take this AC voltage, I will rectify it to have a DC voltage here. So now this part over there acts like a converter from AC to DC voltage. Here I have a DC voltage and then this part works like a converter from DC back to AC but now AC means that here I'm able to change the frequency of the current that I feed to the motor. So here in the simplest case we have a diode rectifier. It is a three-phase rectifier. It rectifies this AC voltage into DC voltage over there. Now this DC link capacitor, this acts like a storage. Uh, so because here we have a sine wave, and uh, we want to store here the energy as a DC voltage. So we want to have a constant voltage over there on those rails. So this is a typically quite a large capacitor, both mechanically and uh, uh, in the capacity as well. And uh, here we have what's called the inverter itself. And now the inverter is taking this DC voltage and is producing a variable frequency current that is feeding into the motor. We'll see in a minute how this works. Uh, here in the inverter uh, those components are transistors. And the transistors here they act like switch. So now let me explain you uh, how this part of the inverter actually works. Uh, well, I will go back a little bit to, to this uh, later. Uh, so uh, let's say now here we are at this stage. We already have some DC voltage available. Uh, so here this can be modeled like a DC power supply. Now typically the voltage that we have here is something like 650 volts, so fairly high voltage DC. And uh, therefore the switches here, they need to be working with higher voltages to have some safety margin. So typically those switches are rated for uh, 1200 volts or even higher voltages. So now we can model these transistors just as a switch. Now this is my motor here. Uh, this motor, an induction motor, this is an inductive load. So I can model one phase of this induction motor simply like this. Here uh, it's an inductor and here it's a resistor like that. And now let's have just one switch that will be switching like this. And here uh, we'll have plus and minus voltage. So this is a very simple model of an RL circuit. Uh, this switch actually is one of the switches that we have here in the in the inverter itself. So now what will happen is that we will control the switching of this switch. We will uh, uh, we will connect the control for this switch to a rectangular voltage. So we'll do something like this. Uh, we will apply a voltage that has this shape, like that. So this is time and this is voltage. And now we will see what will be the current in my circuit, what will be the current that is shown here. So here this will be the current in the circuit. And uh, we know that uh, this will be a transient response. Now this will be a first order transient response. We have an RL circuit. So this response of the current will be an exponential function. And uh, let's say it will start from zero current. Now it will be an exponential response like this. Here we turn the switch off so the current will decrease exponentially like this. Here at this moment we turn again the current on so it will be exponential. 
here we turn it off it will be exponential like this and so on so so far nothing very new Now the new thing is that uh, we may change the duty cycle of this signal so at one instant uh, we may produce a voltage that is this long and then here it will be off then we can increase the width so this will be the, the period t here will be two periods here will be three periods for example so again this is t and this is voltage uh, here for the third period i can have it longer and then off and then longer again so now we are changing the duty cycle so the ratio between on and off time and if we now plot the current we'll see the following response here uh, now I'll stop over there uh, let me just plot the, the intervals here and uh, the current will look like this here I will start from this value I will increase it and then I will decrease it and it's zero here I will increase decrease increase decrease increase and so on so by changing the width of the pulse so by changing the on time versus on off time here I'm able to change the current and if you calculate the average current you may actually find that it will be something like this and if you change the weight properly then this might be a sine function so uh, at the end what we are producing as the current into the motor like this uh, can be a sine function so it will be looking like this time and here is the current uh, we can change the frequency because if we modify this algorithm to produce let's say faster changes of the duty cycle then this could be a sinusoidal wave with higher frequency now obviously it's a little bit more complicated because here we need to control the six switches because we want to produce three currents we need to, to have one current there one current there and one current there but uh, this is basically done by those six switches in the inverter uh, this is called PWM this stands for pulse width modulation so PWM is uh, the way the frequency inverter is actually generating the output current that we have over there now the function of this DC link capacitor is uh, to act like a buffer so to produce us a steady voltage that we have here on the DC bus so uh, this is an example how such a DC link capacitor looks like it has a quite large capacity it needs to be designed for high voltage uh, for example the ones here are designed for 2400 volts so very high voltage very high capacity also mechanically very large this could be for example 20 centimeters height so it's the, the largest component that you have in the frequency inverter and uh, the, this diode rectifier is uh, acting only uh, like a converter from AC to DC so on the input here we have a sine wave like this from the power network three voltages shift by 120 degrees same amplitude same frequency and when you rectify this you see that we take just those peaks of uh, the voltage and uh, the reason for this DC capacitor is to smooth out this voltage ripple without the, the DC link capacitor we would have this voltage ripple uh, on uh, the DC bus voltage so this acts like a filter now this is the simplest Professor. connection uh, we'll see that more advanced uh, connections have this replaced also with this structure uh, do you know what's the efficiency of this system like, do we get any losses on that when we try to switch from AC to DC and from DC to AC again? Yes, the efficiency is very high. It's about 98%, 97, 98. 
uh, it actually depends on the switching frequency here the higher the switching frequency the higher the switching losses uh, but typically it's very high uh, so uh, the inverter of course will create you some additional losses in the system but uh, it will allow you to have uh, control over the current and over torque and over the speed that you have in the induction motor now the schematic that you see here is only the principle of it at the end it's a quite complicated connection because you need sensors you need uh, some control system and uh, for this reason the inverter itself is typically about the same price like the motor so if your motor will be something like I don't know 10,000 check crowns uh, maybe t then the inverter will be approximately the same so this is suitable only for applications where you really need to have torque and speed control uh, something, some few words about the switch here uh, this switch is uh, usually created by transistors that are called IGBT uh, this stands for insulated gate bipolar transistor it's a bipolar transistor that is designed for high voltages uh, typically this is about 1200 uh, volts at least although they are uh, they are also available for higher voltages uh, like 1700 volts uh, and also for lower voltages something like 650 volts but the industry standard is at least uh, one 0.2 kilovolts that you have here uh, we are switching about 650 volts so the the other 650 volts approximately uh, is the safety margin uh, to save the switches uh, now here we have the switch the transistor and in parallel here uh, we have a diode the goal of the diode is to protect the transistor against uh, when when you disconnect the current through the transistor and also to provide uh, some path where the current can actually flow uh, when it's flowing like this so this can be used like a generator as well this could be a generator and then through those diodes it can go back into the DC link and then you can do something with the energy uh, that you have available so uh, this can operate like a motor mode but it can operate like uh, a generator mode as well with one uh, with one modification which I will show you in a minute uh, so here let's take a look in more detail on the PWM that we actually do now the advantage of PWM frequency inverter here is that the switch operates only in switching mode this means that it's either fully on or fully off obviously also the control needs to make sure that this switch and this switch is not on at the same time so because otherwise we would have a short circuit like this in the DC bus uh, this is how the voltage looks like uh, when you measure it here on uh, the terminal of the motor so for some period like this you have positive voltage pulses and here you have negative voltage pulses uh, you can see here uh, how the weight is increasing so here we have very narrow pulses and here we are increasing the weight and then we're decreasing it again and here the same increasing weight higher weight and smaller weight and here is how the current will look like so when we have applied the voltage for longer time will have higher current here and during those narrow pulses uh, we apply the voltage for a, only a specific short amount of time and this will give us small current now this is the sine wave that you can actually increase uh, the, the frequency so if you do this faster then you will have higher frequency of the current now the limitations are the following now one limitation is uh, in the switching frequency of the elements you cannot go to very high switching frequencies because the, the losses on the transistor are a function of uh, switching 
frequency. The higher the switching frequency, the higher the switching loss. And therefore you need to cool down all the losses that you have in the inverter. So also the efficiency of the frequency inverter is a function of uh, the switching frequency. If you double it, you increase the, fre the, lo the losses. Uh, you can see here also this distortion. Now if you look in more detail, for example in this picture here, you will see a transient response during turn on and a transient response during turn off. So if you measure it on the oscilloscope it will look like this. Now this is a waveform that I measured uh, on Monday on one of the frequency inverters that we are actually building. Uh, this is the current that is flowing in the motor and uh, this is the voltage that is on the switch of the on the transistor so this is the top transistor this is the bottom transistor you can see that uh, when the top transistor is on here this transistor is off and so on and here we could we could find that here this current is decreasing here this current is increasing so this is a zoom on this region uh, on the, this sawtooth uh, waveform of the current. Uh, how can you use it? Uh, well, uh, with the frequency inverter uh, you basically have a control over current and over frequency. So what you are doing is that you can freely change the current frequency and uh, this will give you a response in speed of the induction motor. So uh, the torque speed characteristic that we know will be different for different available frequencies. Let's say we have a motor that was designed for 50 Hz. So for 50 Hz we have this torque speed characteristic and uh, we are operating in a similar fashion like I already showed you on the efficiency map. Up to the nominal speed here we can use the constant torque so this is over there and then above the nominal speed we are ev uh, we have the constant power so this is uh, constant power mode and this is constant torque mode you can so you can see that above the nominal frequency we have higher speed but we have lower torque that is actually available uh, if you plot it uh, as a percentage of uh, torque and power versus frequency, uh, it will look like this. So we, here you have constant torque available and then the torque is dropping. And uh, here you have increasing power and here you have constant power. Now uh, here this is obviously like switching without any, any transition. Uh, this is a, just a change of the control algorithm. This way is called V to have control, voltage to frequency control. Uh, we can change the voltage and the frequency and control the speed of the motor. Uh, here are a few examples of uh, such uh, frequency inverters. How do they look like? So uh, inside uh, there are those three components as you have seen plus some control circuits, microprocessor that controls all this and then on the display you can see the actual frequency and uh, you have uh, some controls that allow you to change uh, the, the speed and the torque and many parameters of the motor. Uh, here is a video, uh, just take a look on that, uh, um, how does it work, I will not run it right now. Uh, some warnings before uh, you use uh, frequency inverters everywhere. Now, uh, frequency inverters are not supposed to work with old motors. The reason is uh, visible here in this chart. Now, old motors are supposed to be powered with uh, sinusoidal voltage. So here we don't have a sinusoidal voltage. Here we have a very sharp pulses of the voltage that look like this. So we have, we have either no voltage or high voltage here. And uh, this means that if you zoom out the, the voltage here, this will be time and voltage, 
and the voltage is changing from nothing to something like this very quickly. This change can happen very fast. Now for IGBTs this might be something like 1 microsecond, for example 500 nanoseconds. And we're changing from 0 volts to 650 volts. So in other words we have a very high value of the rate of change, so dV over dt. And uh, this can cause trouble in older motors because older motors were not designed for that. And you may have issues with B-rings and you may have issues with insulation. I will explain you why. Uh, this is a sketch of uh, some motor uh, that uh, is like an older motor and uh, we'll see what happens now if we connect it to the frequency inverter. Now if it's powered by a sine wave power then there is no problem at all. The motor was designed for this. So this, this is the stator winding, this is the rotor and this is how the magnetic flux uh, is uh, flowing actually. And uh, here we have the bearings and uh, the current can flow also through the bearings. Now in case of sine wave power this is not a big issue because this current is uh, very small or even zero because we have a very small rate of change of the current. But what will happen is that uh, if we connect this motor to a PWM source we now have a very high uh, dV to dt. Uh, so uh, there will be additional currents that will be created. Uh, you can see the currents here. Uh, the sh one shown in red here is uh, the stator to rotor current. So here it's flowing from the rotor through the bearing in the stator and it forms like a loop here. Uh, you will have also some current uh, flowing from the rotor into the shaft like this into the ground and uh, you will have also currents in uh, the stator winding so one current from the stator winding here uh, shown in blue will, will flow to ground uh, one current like this will flow through the bearing into the load and then into the ground so here you will have the following issue with the bearing it's shown here if, imagine here the, the ball of the bearing this is the inner track, this is the outer track and now there is a current flowing through that and here at those edges the current will enter into the ball and, in, and into the track so in time very soon uh, this will cause you damage of the bearings because here uh, you will have uh, troubles uh, as the current will flow so for this reason newer motors that are supposed to work with uh, frequency inverters they need to insulate electrically the rotor from the stator so those bearings cannot be normal ball bearings with metallic balls but at least one of the bearings needs to have ceramic bearing, cer ceramic balls so those bearings are called sometimes also hybrid bearings so this is a metallic track but this is not metallic this is um, this is a ceramic ball. At least one of them, in some cases two, but uh, at least one of them needs to be uh, needs to be used. So that's a problem. This uh, here uh, you can see uh, an example of what actually happens uh, in the bearing. Here you can see the damage uh, of of the bearing tracks in time. So it, those. Uh, those lines uh, are actually created by the current that is flowing in the motor. Here you can see under the microscope what actually happens. So, like those pits uh, are crea created, and this is a this is the voltage uh, recorded from the oscilloscope. Uh, you can see that uh, here we have a large peak, and then when basically like a spark that uh, jumps between the the ball and the track, and then it's discharged and this is uh, creating the damage of uh, this bearing. So be careful about this. Uh, you need to uh, either use a motor that is specially designed 
uh, with the uh, ceramic ball bearings or you can use older motors that uh, use uh, something that's called a sine wave filter and this uh, filter creates a uh, sine wave voltage from the PWM voltage we'll not go into details but it's also possible to use this but this is more expensive uh, you need additional components it looks like this it's quite large quite heavy and so on uh, so the preferred way or how it's done usually is to, to use uh, this kind of uh, ceramic ball bearings as you can see here uh, some examples those are the ceramic balls okay that's it for today now we'll do the model test and uh, next week we will finish with a single phase commutator motor and uh, we will start uh, the uh, synchronous motors as well.